Patch Quest could be defined as a Metroidvania roguelite bullet hell that features dozens of rideable mounts, all of which have their own unique abilities. As the player character, it's your job to explore this ever-changing island by utilizing your lasso to capture these beasts and venture through the randomized patches, collecting various weapons, upgrades, pins, and companions along the way. There are also dungeons to be explored, various bosses to defeat, and skills to be unlocked as well. That said, today's video aims to break Patch Quest down by what I believe are the three major pillars, being the game's unique style, the monster riding elements which also incorporate the lasso, and the mashup between the Metroidvania and roguelite genres. Generally when doing these types of reviews we also look at the game's story, however Patch Quest, while it does have a plot, it's more so set up with a very simple premise with a true focus of the game being its gameplay elements. With all that being said, this will all culminate together and provide us with a clear picture of whether or not Patch Quest Early Access is worth the cash. Alright, so for starters, Patch Quest takes place on a strange island which quite literally is made up of various patches that are consistently swapping around. As of such, the game's art style features a flat 2D patch-like environment and characters alike. There is a distinct consistency with the game's art in that nothing really feels out of place despite the various biomes, which we have mountains, deserts, jungles, and even a coast, all of which simultaneously fit under the major theme of the game whilst also standing out in their own right. Honestly, I think this goes without saying, just by looking at what's on screen, that Patch Quest's art style does exactly what it sets out to do. I've seen many monster taming games where certain monsters, while looking really cool, don't necessarily feel unique or specific to that IP, as well as other graphical assets, but that's not an issue here. I mean, just looking at the monsters on screen, you tell me, do you see any monsters that really feel out of place or feel like they don't belong within the game? Honestly, this is gonna be the shortest segment in the review by far, just because in my eyes, it's a pretty open and closed case that the art style really fits and is really sharp. There's not much more to delineate on. Now, when it comes to the game's gameplay, there is actually a lot that goes into it. So this is gonna be the real meaty part of this review. I'm gonna break this up into two major segments, the first being the monster riding mechanic. This entire mechanic revolves around an item called the lasso. Essentially, what needs to be done is you need to hook your enemies with the lasso and then circle them a particular amount of times depending on the tier of your opponent. Regular mounts are one circle, mounts with a silver crown are two, and finally mounts with a gold crown are three circles. These monsters each vary in size as well. You can also think of this mechanic as a much better version of the circling in Pokemon Ranger, where if you take damage whilst trying to circle the creature, you will lose your latch. It requires a balance between paying attention to what the creature you're attempting to mount is doing and also spatial awareness as it pertains to your own location. Oftentimes you'd be in a situation where you're heavily outnumbered and while you can use your gun without a mount, being solo doesn't give you the versatility, mobility, defensive and offensive capabilities, and powers of teaming up. You do get access to various ammo types, including explosive, rifle, rapid fire, homing, and more, all of which come with their own special charge move, which, as it sounds, can be charged up. These ammos are found within various fruits on the island. Now, once you do manage to get your first mount, you have a couple of things to look out for. The first is the amount of energy that your mount has, which once depleted will knock you off and can be replenished through certain items and landing your skill shots. Each monster starts at level zero and you can increase it up to level three, learning a new ability at every level up. These abilities can be broken up into offensive and defensive with the level one ability being the defensive and number two and three being offensive. Patch Quest really shines in this aspect as there are really a ton of unique and inspired abilities on both ends. You have defensive abilities that allow you to leap over or through enemy attacks, deflections, burrowing, or even a crazy monkey flip. On the offensive side, you have various types of attacks that include inflicting status conditions, laying traps for your enemies, and more. Each mount has its own unique style of play and it's up to you as the player to find which synergizes with your play style. What's even better is if you do like a particular monster's ability but feel as though perhaps it's not your style of play, you can also recruit multiple pets to your home which can be later summoned during a run, adding another layer to the monster system. You don't have to ride the pets that you call, but instead could use them as companion mounts, which I think is really great. For me, as someone who enjoys a mount with a lot of mobility, I can understand why certain slower mounts have their own merits, but I personally don't want to play with it, so using one as a companion character really helps in that aspect. 
You can also gain various status conditions, which work as either buffs or debuffs, and there is quite the range, including ones that increase movement speed, offensive power, your defense, etc. And some really cool debuffs, including ones that make you sneeze, aka you get stunned every once in a while, one that makes you sticky, which causes you to stick to various objects, and more. There's also a skill point system, which allows a player to unlock various perks, which also makes traversing the island easier. You have perks like being able to take a hit whilst lassoing, creating a shockwave whilst getting hit, etc. These are all much welcome features within the game. There are also various power-ups in which you can obtain, some of which include increasing your mount damage, making you more evasive, increasing the power of your melee attacks, etc. You'll oftentimes get these buffs via defeating enemy waves, but you can also find them at certain shrines as well. Each of these add an extra layer of progression to each individual run and should not be downplayed in their effectiveness. Evasion in particular is very useful when stacked. Those who are watching my Let's Play series can attest to this. Now finally, we have the pin system, which at first you might be confused as to how it works, but after defeating your first shrine, which we'll get into in a bit, you can make use of. Basically, after defeating certain enemy waves, you'll gain access to an ability to grab one of the environments and repin it somewhere later for a permanent spawn. You can pretty much grab anything from ammo plants to field hazards to completely useless stuff, and when you exit a run or die, the patches will shuffle with the exception of the ones in which you've pinned and placed. This means that you can strategically leave certain power-ups or bonuses for yourself and use them to your advantage when venturing into the wilds. Okay, so the final pillar to discuss is a mesh between the roguelite and metroidvania aspects of the game. We have sort of touched on them already as the monster riding mechanic is very connected. Hence why you might have seen a blur between monster riding and just general mechanics with this review. However, in this part of the video, we're going to be referring to more of how the world operates, including its various dungeons, bosses, map, etc. So the game's Metroidvania inspiration comes from the actual layout of its map, with it being static in nature and unchanging, with bosses and dungeons always remaining in the same spot. If you don't know what Metroidvania means, it basically refers to games like Metroid and Castlevania that feature these large, essentially open labyrinths that allow the player to explore at their own leisure. You'll generally see certain blocked off areas with various requirements. The roguelite aspects of the game refers to the randomized nature of the individual tiles, what appears in each area in terms of ammo, enemies, pins, field hazards, etc., are all determined by the game's randomizing algorithm, which gives a unique experience every time, whilst also staying within the confines of that particular area you're in. But more on that in a sec. The light in roguelite is that you don't fully lose your progression when you fail a run, but instead keep your progression each time you die with, yes, you losing your mount, buffs, ammo, etc., but keeping your defeated bosses and areas conquered. From the get-go, this game features four main biomes which connect through the player house area, though you are only given access to the jungle at the beginning. Through exploration, you can unlock the others by destroying crystals from behind various doors. The house is located in the middle of the map, so this becomes very useful. The biomes in particular include the aforementioned jungle, as well as the hills, the coast, and the desert, and as you'd expect, each area comes with its own unique set of monsters, which makes sense given the biome, and through exploring the labyrinth, you'll find various connections between them. There are also some sub areas that can be explored on the corners of the map. However, I'm not going to spoil everything, so I'm just gonna leave them out, but I will give you a hint that we did show one of them in this review. Now, each of the areas holds its own dungeon, which you can explore and carries with it a boss enemy, which in these cases are big versions of regular enemies with unique movesets. These fights can actually be quite difficult, especially if you're using a mount you're not very comfortable with. For me, the monsters available within the jungle just didn't fit my playstyle, so without using a pet, I found it very hard to defeat this boss. I will say that I think in a lot of aspects, Patch Quest really nailed the idea of having two genres that you wouldn't think of putting together, but somehow work. By nature, the roguelike genre features randomization and resetting progression, and the Metroidvania genre is completely the opposite, with the worlds being very set in how they are and featuring progression heavily. Liam spent years trying to figure out what exactly he thought his game needed, and at one point even started from scratch to create something that he truly thought was enjoyable, challenging, and unique, and I'd say he'd crushed it on all accounts. For what Patch Quest is and what it tries to achieve, I really can't say I have any major complaints about the game. I would say that I found some monsters to seem 
less viable than others. For example, the Sandmander can burrow underground for multiple seconds to avoid any damage. Then there's something like the Guild Wing, whilst it can move in spurts to avoid enemy damage, it has a lot more hurt frames and despite the lower cooldown, just doesn't seem as powerful. The thing is though, when it comes to balancing and stuff like that, we also have to keep in mind that this is an early access title and even then the game doesn't stand out as being heavily unbalanced. Any minor issues that people see with the balancing will likely be tweaked given said early access nature. On this channel, I've reviewed and dissected various early access titles, and I've played even more. I've played early access titles that you can beat in less than a couple hours, I've played early access titles that require dozens of hours, and I've played everything in between. Patch Quest is an example of a game that was adjusted and improved during its beta phase, and its early access to me feels like a full game that just has free DLC coming. Anything extra that comes to Patch Quest is just stuff that he wanted to add rather than things that need to be fixed, and the game as it is does not feel incomplete. So if you want a game that you can just pick up at any time and play casually or otherwise, have your heart racing during certain encounters, enjoy a monster taming game that is unique to the genre and that it does not feature typical turn-based combat or even what you'd expect from real-time combat, then I'd say Patch Quest is 100% the game for you. If you like titles like Adore, which is another monster taming roguelite, you'll definitely love this game as well. So is it worth the cash? Well, I'm recording this video before the price is actually live, but from what I've gathered, it's going to be around $20 USD, which in my opinion is a steal for a game with this level of attention to detail and overall sharpness. When it launches tomorrow on May 7th, 2021, I highly recommend playing it for yourself and try to tell me it's not worth the cash. So yeah, guys, all in all, I do have to say Patch Quest is honestly a really good game for what it tries to be, and I look forward to continuing to cover it on the channel. If you do enjoy monster taming content like this, definitely make sure to like and subscribe to this channel to see more as we chiefly focus on the monster taming genre. You can also follow me on Twitter at GymLeaderEd and check out my subscriber discord. All links will be in the description. Until next time, peace.